All right. Yes, indeed. Well, here we are recording and we are here for another discussion of the Malazan Book of the Fallen. Specifically, we are going to be discussing The Bone Hunters. This is book six of the series. And you always have a better cover than I do. Well, it's, I have I like that cover. covers. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> Each one better than mine, probably. <laughs> but hey, I had a great time reading this. So by the way, hello, AP. How are you today? Uh, <laughs> it's, I am doing very well. Thank you very much, Philip. Once again, a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's always great fun to chat to you. And uh, I see that uh, you're looking very spiffy in a slightly different jacket. Was was the tweed singed on the other one? You see this? Leather patches. Elbow patches. Try singeing this one. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, yes, I've, I've, I've put on one of my other uh, jackets for today since you singed my other one with uh, our, uh, <laughs> our, our nemesis, uh, our rival poetry readings. A lot of fun, by the way. That was a whole lot of fun. And I also really enjoyed your reading of Brash Fluster's masterpiece, or I should say recital. It's this, this. I don't know why I'm friends with Ericsson. Like, really. <laughs> you know, this this would be a great idea, a AP. You read that, and I'll I'll do these bits, and you're like, yeah. <laughs> you know, here I am trying to pretend to be someone serious, someone who has points to make, and it's like, no, no, no. I'm going to right. read this absolutely ridiculous poem. Great. Yeah. Well, it was well done. The only thing you lacked was a harp. So, you know, that would have been nice if you had been drumming along with your recital, but we'll take what we can get. It would have been better for the pun for it to be a liar. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so anyway, we are here to discuss The Bone Hunters, and this is our non-spoiler discussion of The Bone Hunters, and we will be having a spoiler-filled discussion on this book six of the Malazan Book of the Fallen. And that spoiler-filled discussion, as usual, will be appearing on a Critical Dragon AP's channel. So make sure to check that out. You'll be following this video probably a few days after. So uh, so here we go. This, just, uh, this was a tremendous read for me. The Bone Hunters was, uh, wow. It's, it's a big book too. Uh, and there are just a lot of moments uh, that, I found myself incredibly moved by the usual, you know, uh, breaking down <laughs> and uh, shuddering and, and uh, trying to suppress those tears. There's some just wonderful moments in here, uh, just incredible stuff. And one thing I wanted to talk about was when we were having our discussion with Steven Erickson about our, it was our mid-series chat, actually. And he mentioned, because The Bone Hunters was going to be up next, that it's two books in one, in a sense. So I thought it might be interesting for us to talk about this in a non-spoiler way, the structure of the Bone Hunters being a two book thing, which is, it seems like every book in the series has some unique thing about the structure of it. Uh, and the Bone Hunters is this kind of interesting two book thing in one. And I'd also like to talk about the, the notion that, well, things seem to be really converging here. And in the previous five books, we've had the various theaters and uh, going back to your uh, World War II analogy, how there, we start with one theater in Gardens of the Moon in Genebacus, and then we go to the next theater in Dead House Gates in Seven Cities, and then switch back and then back again. And then in book five, we're introduced to another continent, to the Laveri and all of that. So here in book six things just kind of converge don't they so uh did, so do you agree with with uh, erickson that this is two books in one well uh firstly it said it, instead of us saying that we agree with one another i i've realized we should be saying uh doctor do you concur <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> but the to pick up on, on one of the points that you mentioned there um, we, we have this expectation with a series uh, and because it is presented as a series, because it is presented as a, a complete story of those 10 volumes, 
that there's going to be a chronological progression, that there's going to be some element of this book follows that book follows that book. And you have that linear progression. One of the things that attracts me to the Malazan Book of the Fallen is it is very difficult to say, oh, this number book is just like that number book. Every book is its own thing. They, they are all yeah. actually quite different to one another. And that is, if you think about it, that's exceptionally rare to find authors willing to uh, deviate from something that works. Uh, they go, I have yeah. an established mode for a series. But even though, say, structurally, uh, Erickson has played around with things, or uh, in the case of one of the later books, uh, in terms of the uh, some aspects of the narrative voice, there are always points of connection. There are always thematic stra uh, strands running through everything. There are character right. strands running through everything. There are always these core narrative cables that link all of them together. And yeah. this book, uh, as you you had said, sort of books one and three very much focused on one element. And book one introduces some things, three sort of concludes some of those things. Two and four, we had that similar sort of pairing. So think of them, thinking of them as geologies right. within uh, this framework. Then book five, introducing a new and basically the final uh, major arena and players in the game. So now that that's been introduced, how do you bring in the elements from books one and three, the elements from books two and four to tie into that. And that's what we're seeing, I think, in, in this novel. This is a novel that is tying up some of those elements from those earlier threads and linking them directly and overtly to the new arena that was introduced, the new concepts and characters that were there to show right. how it is building towards something else. So, do you concur? Doctor, I do concur. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, it, it, what you describe is that convergence. And I have heard some people even say, well, the series kind of begins in, in book six. And, well, not really, actually. The series begins in the first book. And all those elements that you were talking to have brought us to this point. And we wouldn't, it, this wouldn't make sense without all of those previous uh, threads c coming together. And it's so, it, it is a wonderful thing though, how they do come together in the Bone Hunters. It, it kind of feels like things have become more intense. Things have been ratchet as much as the, I mean, the previous books were just mind blowing, of course, but it, it does feel like more and more connections are being made and, and characters you kind of previously thought, wow, it'd be cool if these two characters could meet. They're actually meeting now. And it's kind of fun in that sense too. So it, yeah, it's it's just a it's a it's a really cool part of the journey to be in right now. I would say book six, as we're you know this is the second half of the series, and um, it feels like if we were on a roller coaster, we've kind of gone all the way up to, up, 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 up to the top, and now we're about to plunge down this you know <laughs> or something like that. I don't know, but. Um, but it's, it's, it was an incredible read for me. Very, very moving. Um, so I guess we should talk about some of the themes then that I found so moving. Uh, one of the things that uh, you and I both did a, uh, our rival readings of uh, The Age Descending, which is the, uh, the poem in The Bone Hunters that is uh, an epigraph for the, you could say for the prologue or for the entire book. And it actually relates in many ways to the series as a whole. And one of the lines in that poem is give answer, give answer. And the idea of giving answer is something that recurs not only in the Bone Hunters, but in the series as a whole. This is a phrase that Erickson uses. And so I thought we could talk about that for a moment. What exactly do you think he means by giving answer and and of course this is not spoiler but in a general sense what do we mean when we are wanting someone to give answer well uh, i i think it's been firmly established in the the earlier books that there is conflict on the divine plane shall we say yeah 
uh, the, the supernatural conflict. There is a, a, an international conflict happening between the Malazan Empire and uh, the, the various forces uh, it has encountered. There is internal conflict within the Malazan Empire. And again, we have seen that in, from, in Gardens of the Moon all the way through, that there's, there's this uh, almost fractalization of the idea of these competing forces that when viewed externally seem homogenous, seem uh, cohesive, seem uh, monolithic. And yet each time Ericsson drops us into the midst of that monolith uh, to, to then see it is riven with its own fractures and competing interests. Yeah. And when we have this, uh, all of this conflict, this tension, how is it going to be resolved? Uh, how do we get to um, a beneficial outcome? And that brings into question the, the very essential uh, core of all of this debate. What is a good outcome? Yeah. And this, this I think, is, is an absolutely fascinating uh, aspect that plays through a lot of the series. And yes. it, we, we see elements of it each time. The, the competing interests of what is best for the individual, what is best for their group, what is best for uh, the greatest number of people, moving from various elements of like utilitarianism um, all the way through right. to a much more individualistic approach. And I think uh, what we see explored each time, um, and it, it's something that ties into uh, the idea of the Malazan books being postmodern, is not trying yeah. to give a definitive answer, but to show these different aspects in different ways so that each time a reader can, can look at it and go, oh, definite, they should do this thing. And then see another situation that is slightly different, but when yeah. you look at the bones of it, is actually exactly the same decision. But this time, because of the narrative perspective or because of a specific event, the reader has a completely different answer to it and you go well hang on yeah. a second if in instance one you believed that they should have done that thing because that would have been the best possible outcome and you are relying on the best possible outcome for the greatest number of people why are you now disagreeing with that as a philosophical approach to the solving of this issue yeah yeah it's interesting because this very much relates to uh, the theology of the Malazan world insofar as we can use that phrase and i think we can the gods and this is something that is series uh, long are mixed up with these uh, with us mortals and there are many times in the series where characters are asking the gods to give answer for the suffering, there, there's a lot of suffering that takes place. How could you possibly justify this suffering? And there are various approaches to it. As you say, there's utilitarianism. There are other you know, um, considerations that, that the, the various characters coming from various perspectives will lay claim to as um, explanations for why. Um, but, it, but it's interesting because the gods at, at many times don't seem to be in any better position than we mortals to answer these sorts of questions either, do they? Um, it's so <laughs> the gods suffer as well and they partake in the suffering. They dole it out, but they also experience it. Um, so it, it's really interesting. There is no uh, one omniscient, uh, omnipotent figure that the uh, characters can ask to give answer for all of this suffering, I suppose, in, in the Malazan context. Um, but nevertheless, you do see characters questioning the gods and wondering why aren't you gods doing something about this? Why are, why are you messing with us here, right? And, and yet, when, when we think back to, obviously, like one of the, the models for this style of fantasy, the, the Greek myths, the Roman myths, even the Norse myths, right. this idea right. of a pantheon of powerful individuals, but they are not omniscient. They are not all powerful. They, right, uh, right. they are very, they have their strengths and their weaknesses. And right. what happens when these powerful figures 
intervene in mortal affairs. It yeah. works out well for some mortals, but it is not going to work out well for others. Yeah. And when we we consider the the diversity amongst the pantheon in the Malazan world, some of these gods have been around for hundreds of thousands of years. Yep. Some of the gods are much, much newer. Yes. And there's a very different approach. Each one of them obviously is colored by their their character. Like they are yep. distinct entities. But you can see an almost divergent opinion about what is going to be good. And and this is kind of you know what we're we're talking around. If you think uh, even in to related to the uh, real world, the modern day, yeah, quite often you can have two opposing political parties, and we're we're not getting into the discussion of merits of any particular party, but you can have two right. opposing political parties, and party A says the best thing for this country is to do X, party B says the worst thing to do for this country is X, and yep. The best thing to do is why, and party A says why. That's insane. That's a terrible thing to do for this country, because right. they are diametrically opposed in how they are viewing the the problem, the situation, what a good result is going to be. The idea of a positive result is dependent on perspective. Is dependent on this perception of the event, and everything is limited, subjective and dependent on your point of view and your ideology right interesting yeah i mean the whole series is a beautiful meditation on the role of suffering in the human experience but it also presents so many moments of beauty really compelling these are the ones that just grab me and among them are many examples of connections made and bonds formed uh, and often under very difficult circumstances through trauma and often in a military context, but not always. Um, and many characters going on journeys together. And these, this is another, I think, running theme in a way, the, the, the bonds, the human bonds that we form during our respective journeys through life. And it's just so beautifully portrayed in this series. And they're just, we can't be specific now, but we will later. But there's so many wonderful examples of this in the Bone Hunters. Yeah, and and again, like to to relate it back to uh, like a real sort of example of of this sort of thing, we can look at it metaphorically. We are all on the the journey of our lives. We are traveling from when we are born to when we die, and we meet these people along the way. There's your big metaphorical life is a journey. But mm -hmm. if you've ever had to sit in a car with someone and drive across country, and it's a like seven Canada, for drive, example. Canada would be would be one example. But if you've <laughs> ever had to sit in a car with someone on a long journey, that is a real test of friendship. And it's a real, yeah. you, you can bond over it or by the end of it, uh, you will never speak to each other again. It's a real and test, especially if you turn on his seat warmer. <laughs> <laughs> but this is this is one of these very curious things so uh you know obviously uh, in the malazan books we've seen a lot of soldiers going on a march and they're sitting around at a campfire or the uh, quibbling with one another and and uh trying to wind each other up and arguing and and quite a lot of bitterness developing but when yeah. push comes to shove th there is a bond there because it's a, a a trial they went through together it's something they share and yep. even if they dislike one another, it's like, yes, we may dislike one another, but I, those people over there are trying to kill both of us. So you are my squad mate, and I'm always going to side with you first. That there, there's a lot of that in, in the Malazan books. That doesn't yep. come as a surprise. In Dead House Gates, we got a lot of people traveling together to literalize that metaphor again, to talk about those sorts of things and, and how it can fracture relationships or how relationships can develop over this time that are not necessarily by the end of it we're best buds that it it's complicated human nature is complicated yes um, i think what we see a lot of in the bone hunters is the real formation 
of a lot of these characters, the uh, realization of who these characters are as individuals, as part of a unit, as part of the story, that this, right. for me at least, is one of the most character driven, despite the big action things that happen in this book, this is one of the most character driven uh, novels in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. Dead House Gates for me is one of the most emotionally driven ones. Yeah. But this one for me is very much about the characters, about how they come to be who they are and exploring yeah. those dynamics of relationship, which are complex and contradictory and difficult and not easily explained. Because yeah. with narrative, uh, with a lot of, uh, particularly in genre writing, we get used to a very simplified form of what character is. It's like, here is this person. These are their two, one, two or three character traits. That is all that they are. We're now going to go on a series of quests and they will learn a lesson and move on. Here we have complex characters that have contradictions, that don't have easy, simple cardboard cutouts or boxes that we can just put them in, that they, they really are unique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's so much to riff off of there. Uh, the uh, the bonds formed, the complexity of identity and how we have layers of identity, all of us do. We have various loyalties that we don't even think about most of the time. And sometimes those loyalties can conflict. Some of our ideals conflict with some of our loyalties and this can put us in incredibly difficult situations. We really see this in the Bone Hunters. And you have uh, really some great arcs in here with characters who can be enemies, but then suddenly uh, through some trauma or some situation or some circumstance are forced to be with each other and find their commonality. And that can be incredibly moving. And it's just so interesting how not only do you see friends made from enemies, but how our identities are so complex that way and how you didn't realize there was a certain part of you that would respond to these people whom you had dismissed as evil or the other or whatever. This is something that I, th I just think is so beautifully done in the Bone Hunters. Yeah, and like we, we see that um, when, you know, one of our friends is telling us something and they go, can you believe that so-and-so did blah, 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 blah. And you're like, right. Well, that sounds eminently reasonable to me. And your friend <laughs> is deeply offended that you didn't take their side. And you go, no, no, no. If that person comes over, I'm totally on your side. Like you have my loyalty, but you, you right. do realize they are right. Um, <laughs> and and we, we see that in, uh, in, in small scale and in grand scale. It's so much of what happens in, in the real world. And yet it is rare to see that in narrative because we like these simplified forms. Um, yeah. And when you were talking about uh, this really as, as almost like two books or, or Erickson has referred to it really as as two books kind of squished together. Yeah. Um, and I believe squished is the, the technical term. Um, <laughs> the, there are I, I, I kind of disagree with Erickson. <gasps> oh, yeah. how, how could I disagree with the author about the interpretation of their own? You go because I'm a critic. Um, you're allowed to do that because you're a critic. Yeah, and I, I need to kill him off again. Like he keeps coming yeah. back. Um, <laughs> He's stubborn that way, isn't he? When when we think about this book as being part of a ten book series, let's think yeah. uh, in comparison to the Lord of the Rings. The Lord of the Rings, one story, three volumes, six books. But no one ever really refers to it as the six books. They refer right. to it maybe as the three books. And you go, but look at uh, look at the two towers. It, does that fall neatly into what a novel is, the, the traditional arc of a novel? And you go, well, yeah, yeah. It, in some ways it does, in some ways it doesn't. And that's because we, we've got locked into, particularly in the modern day, a very narrow perception of what a novel should be, of what plot progression should be, of what a plot right, structure right. or narrative structure should be. 
And we forget that there, there are not only a number of different narrative structures that are all very well established, but these are all ways of describing structure in novels. They are, they are not prescriptive, they are descriptive. Right. And right. Authors, authors are free to do, what, to do with them what they will. And a lot of novels do not follow a traditional novel structure where we have different points of view, where we have uh, non-chronological events, where we have a lot of these things playing around with narrative structure. Uh, uh, Ian M. Banks' Fearsome Engine plays around with a lot of this. Uh, and you, you wouldn't say, but that's not a novel or it's, it's a whole lot of different novels. We, we even take something like um, a mosaic novel, like um, some of the, the Witcher, the short story collections are actually sort of framed as mosaic novels or right. um, Sherwood Anderson's Winesburg, Ohio or George R. R. Martin's Wildcard series. There's a lot of stuff going on with different ways of telling story. And while Erickson might sort of say, this is kind of like two novels stuck together. Right. It works as a single volume. It works as a single story in exactly the same way that the two towers works as a single volume as part of the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Um, so it, it, I, I can both understand what Erickson was kind of referring to as a sort of a simple way to explain what he was doing with the structure. But at the same time, it's slightly misleading to say it's like two novels stuck together. Yeah, well, speaking of conflicting perceptions, another, I think, very prominent theme in this one, and this has to do with a lot of the political scheming and stuff like that, but um, the idea of truth versus propaganda. And this is very relevant to today's political world. I think you would agree. Uh, but truth versus propaganda, morality versus expedience, let's say, or fidelity to a kind of morality versus expedience, expedience, doing the right thing. And at what cost? This is a big theme in here. And you see so many characters who, if they're looking out for number one, <laughs> you know, they're going to dump somebody, throw them under the bus, that sort of thing. Whereas there are other characters who do the right thing and they pay a price for it. And this is, this is a very important theme, I think, in The Bone Hunters. It's extremely important. And in the series in general. But it seems to come, as with many of these themes, I feel like they're all threads that go through the entire series, but then they sort of rise to prominence in various books. And for me, this is a big one here, doing the right thing in The Bone Hunters. Would you agree with that? Certainly. And like the, the idea of political expediency and, and propaganda, the power of that and how it is used. I mean, we, we yeah. saw Erickson in uh, Midnight Tides exploring certain ramifications or certain elements of that in, in that book. But here it is made very explicit at the, the core of the novel. But we also have when personal perception, a personal perception of an event is challenged by experiencing the other side, uh, the other perspective of that in a way that you sort of go, maybe I misjudged that. And th there's a, yeah. a, a character I think we should talk about in the spoiler uh, video specifically about this point. Right. But again, th this idea of narrative perspective and uh, the idea of reality itself, as much as I talk about narrative being flexible, reality itself is a flexible concept. And th this is quite frightening, but we yep. can honestly both view the same event and experience different realities. And yep. we see this played out in the political arena and on news media time and time again, that depending on which news outlet you're looking at, they can report exactly the same story with exactly the same set of facts, but they will have narrativized it. It will be presenting those facts from a certain perspective and the the other channel might present it from an opposing perspective and right. it's one of the the great strengths of studying literature of studying history of a lot of the arts and humanities is this uh, emphasis on critical thinking and analysis of being able to yeah. look at narratives like this 
and parse away some of that framing of the information and to be able to compare and contrast different sources to get to a closer very uh, variance of the truth or something that's slightly more objective or something yeah. that perhaps better reflects what went on and we see that in this book we we see assumptions being challenged both the uh national international political the personal we see how external perspectives that have been created that we as reader have engaged in are yeah. suddenly challenged when we get moments with that character that we've been judging and they do not react the way that we thought that they would and therefore right. judgments are wrong so, yeah this is fascinating and another big one is remembrance of course which is very much relates to what you were just talking about um remembrance of the past and how the past is so enmeshed with the present and this is such a uh, an amazingly well done thing here because you have echoes of past events in the bone hunters at specific locations which i can't talk about but specific places with associations that there are these reverberations or echoes of these past events that happen in the present that are given extra depth extra meaning because of the events of the past as well so this is another thing in here that's just fantastic and of course you have the usual humor uh in there yeah, and you have don't you other... don't you be skipping on to that before i've had a chance to talk of course yeah <laughs> <You're taking laughs> remembrance monkey. i would never forget you ap <laughs> i was about to say about this, this whole idea of the past reverberating into and ah, being yes. part of the present and even shaping the future this yeah. this has been there as a key aspect of what Erickson has done from book one, that yeah. the past does not stay buried. It is not gone and forgotten. That those who forget the past or misremember the past yeah. don't understand how they've been shaped by it. That the past is as living and breathing as part of our world as the internet and zoom calls and youtube like all of these things are intimately connected with yeah the past yeah. Uh, we're talking about literature which is narrative which is storytelling all of these narrative structures all of these techniques have a long and storied history these themes we can trace back hundreds thousands of years and i i reckon if you went back far enough in time you would find the early precursors to humanity sitting yeah. in around in a, in a cave somewhere doing the equivalent of, do you know what Bob did last night? You're never going to believe this. He tried to punch a saber toothed tiger in the head. <laughs> <laughs> Bob. And, but this, this is a, a universality. This is a part of the human condition that we yeah. are linked by all these things. We are shaped by these things. And, um, our cultures, our countries, um, our tribes, our families, our friendships are shaped by the past. And Erickson and Esselman, yeah. his works, you can see their understanding and empathy and sympathy for that concept. And instead of being didactic about it, instead of right. shoving it down the throat of the reader and going, you must remember the past and you must be all of this is offered to the reader with a great deal of trust saying yep. i trust you to look at these different things and to think about them and connect them yourself yeah so we are breathing the past and it lives within us i'm glad you said that ap <laughs> so <laughs> actually I'm, I'm actually very glad to uh, have had this discussion with you is there anything else we want to add to the non-spoiler discussion of the bone hunters before we get into spoilers um well i i think we've we've touched on a lot of the big themes i think yes uh the the a core of this novel for me are the the character moments the character development the relationships developing which as you say some of the scenes a lot of humor 
some of the scenes show characters in a bad light. Characters we want to like, yeah. and we see them in a bad light. Other characters we don't want to like, we see in a good light. That uh, yep. there's a lot of challenging reader expectation. And I, I know we talk a lot about Erickson's subversion of blah, blah, blah. And it keeps getting right. blown up. This is not, I, I, I don't think it was, I am going to subvert for the sake of subverting. All of these things were, this happens in fantasy. I am aware of what happens in fantasy. Therefore, wouldn't it be interesting if I did something different with it? And I yeah. think sometimes when we talk about subversion, uh, we, we get this idea that it is a binary. It is subverted or it is not subverted. Instead of thinking about all of the different elements of the genre, all of the different story elements and narrative elements and writing elements as tools and approaches that Erickson and Asselmont play with in the creation of the world, in the writing of their stories, and in how we as readers have expectations and experiences built up through reading other fantasy that get challenged by these things. And yeah, yeah. One last thing to consider is we forget sometimes that reading it today, like this year in 2021, is a radically different world to even 10 years ago. Right, and right. 10 years before that, things that we take for granted today were not mainstream 20 years ago. Yeah. Things that we take for absolute granted today, things that we think should be taken for granted today, things that should be part of society today and authors should be putting in their work, weren't even considerations 20 years ago. And yeah. so there, there's a lot going on in these novels about expectations of the genre. So if you've read fantasy for the last five years, a lot of new fantasy, and you encounter something here, it's not going to have the same element of subversion because a lot of this stuff was very well established, was challenged, and now new authors and, and uh, newer authors are building on it and playing with it in different ways. But I think that's sometimes why we misunderstand what subversion is in, yeah. in the book of the quality. But it is amazing to me how some of the themes that Erickson and Esselmont incorporate into their series seem even more relevant today than they did 10, 20 years ago when they were actually writing the books. And I suspect that these themes will remain relevant. And that's probably a good sign for these books. And, but again, it's if you look at Shakespeare, why has Shakespeare endured? Is he the only yeah. playwright that ever existed? No, because there's something about the stories. There's something about the themes. There's something about the core element of those stories that has yeah. survived, that speaks to successive generations, even though their worldview is different, even though the world changes, the society changes. There is something about them that continues to speak to us. And that's what I, I, we talk about theme a lot. And I know most YouTubers who talk about books don't talk about theme this way. Most fans don't talk about theme this way. They, it can be dismissed because that's not what they're reading for. And that is absolutely fine. Like we all have our own uh, reasons for reading. But one of the things that makes works enduring is this exploration of key themes that remain yep. relevant. Yep. It's about the human experience. It really is. And that's why it resonates. That's why it moves us so much, I think, when we invest in it. And it's just, a, it's a beautiful thing. So, well, AP, thank you so much. It's always such a pleasure to talk to you. And I really appreciate it. I am looking forward to getting into some spoilers with you in just a moment. Thank you very much, Philip. And we better go now before your phone dies. Yeah. <laughs> I'm recording on my phone today, which is a different experience, but I think it's going to work.